Well, the Artemis, now called Insight 100, is a commercially available, very high frequency, digital ultrasound robotic scanner. It's a mouthful. Uh, when I came out of medical school uh, from Cambridge, I, 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 went to the, I went to the States and I went to Cornell University. I, was do, I went to do a bioengineering fellowship, which this is, Cornell had the, one of the leading ultrasound labs in the world. And when I say uh, leading, I mean even though it was an eye department with Jackson Coleman as the chairman as one of the leaders in ultrasound development, and he's an eye surgeon, a lot of the research and development that he did on the eye was then passed on to breast and prostate and other er you know, um, obstetrics, other areas where ultrasound is used. Uh, I was put onto a project in glaucoma with, uh, under Jack Coleman's group with Ron Silverman and Mark Rondeau. And it was a glaucoma project. I you know, didn't know what to do, and, but I was kind of more interested in, rather than being a part of a project that was already ongoing, I wanted to find something that hadn't been done before. Um, and, you know, it was ambitious and, uh, you know, doomed to failure, but I lucked out. I was playing with a little um, rabbit eye uh, in, that had been, you know, a little formalin, we keep the rabbit eye, and everyone went home one evening. And I was scanning this rabbit eye with this brand new high frequency ultrasound transducer. By the way, um, if you're scanning a baby, it's about four megahertz. If you're scanning um, uh, an eye, it's about 10 megahertz. And these were 60 megahertz. So we were getting super high definition images of the different structures. And so I was scanning this, I was turning the eye around and scanning the optic nerve and then the sclera and then the extraocular muscle and the iris and the cornea. And I had this bunch of images. The next morning I went around the corner to the clinic and I went to Cal Roberts who at the time was the professor of cornea at, at, at Cornell. Cornell is, is, you know, one of the Ivy League universities in the States. So I'm going to, you know, and I said, oh, you know, Dr. Roberts, I'm Dan Reinstein, I'm the research fellow. I, I wonder if I could show you some scans. He goes, yeah, of course. He came back, he stood there, I bring up, you know, it was a vax, so this computer was a, a line code to just pull up the image, right? So I'm typing away, I bring up this image and I bring up the cursors and I show him. I said, look, th th this is a scan of a cornea and these are two lines at the front and I looked in a book, it looks like we're looking at the epithelium of the cornea, the, the surface skin of the cornea. And um, in the rabbit, it's supposed to be 30 microns. And when I measure it on this, it looks, it's 33 microns. We can measure the epithelium with one micron precision. Could there be any applications uh, for that? And he went like this. No. And basically, and left the room. And it was like, it was one of those moments where it's like your life, I mean, I spent six months in this lab looking for something that hadn't been done before. And here I bumped into something that the professor of cornea at Cornell University said was of no use. And I knew instantly that that was my ticket for my career. And I was just starting my career in eye surgery. So I spent some, about three months doing skunk work. In other words, I would go to the research meetings, show the stuff on glaucoma that I was supposed to be worked on, but of course in the background during the week I was working on trying to make a map, not just one point measurement, but make a map of the thickness profile of the, epithe of the cornea. And it took me about six weeks to analyze one cornea. It was one scan line at a time. It was laborious. Tons of pages of data that I entered into a plotting program and got a three-dimensional color map. And it was near Christmas. Uh, it was one of the last research meetings of the year. And we were in there and Jack Coleman comes around and says, Dan, um, what's, how, how are you doing? How, how are things going? And I said, well, I, I, um, I have a surprise for everybody. And everyone was like, 
Oh, okay. So, but we need to go around to the lab uh, to see this. So, the seven of us uh, on the team, we, we all sort of trumbled down the uh, corridor and went to the lab, opened the door. I had it all, I had a black uh, cover on the, on, on the Mac. We had, a, we had an Apple, I can't remember, like an Apple II or something, you know, with, the, with and I just, I pulled the, the black uh, cover off the computer and there was a color map. And they were, what is this? And I said, that is the first map of the epithelium of a human cornea that has ever been plotted. And it's one micron precision. And, you know, it, my standing in the department, because Jack Coleman is one of the giants of, of eye surgery. Uh, you know, the number of things that he's contributed to the field are amazing. He's still alive, he's still active, he's still uh, the most wonderful mentor on the planet. I owe him everything. But, you know, when you're just a research fellow in the lab, you're just one of those people that come through. And at that point, you know, the whole, the whole relationship changed. It looked like he, 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 okay, this guy's actually going beyond what we're telling him to do. And I became an eye resident. I, be, I started studying eye surgery formally at, at that point. I was at Mount Sinai Hospital and I retained an appointment as an instructor in ophthalmology at Cornell. So I would finish my clinic at five, six o'clock and go back to the lab and work till 11. And it was just so exciting, right? I mean, it was, it was just, it was like you're, you're onto something, but you don't know what yet. And little by little, scanning corneas that it had LASIK in the early days and scanning complications and not knowing what you're looking at, but working it out layer by little. Eventually, I decided to finish my, after finishing my eye training, my eye surgeon training, instead of going straight into a fellowship to specialize in a specific area of eye surgery, I decided to go back to the lab to build a prototype that could scan not just the central part of the cornea, but the whole of the cornea. And I spent a year on a, on a, on a minuscule salary while all my contemporaries were going on to develop their careers. But I was passionate about this, and we developed a kind of like a Meccano set, practically, um, which uh, worked. And Ron Silverman uh, and Tatiana um, Raevsky did all the programming, um, and this machine then became essentially my, my ticket, right? I got a fellowship with one of the most uh, open-minded and um, forward-thinking eye surgeons in North America at the time was Hugo Sutton in Vancouver, who welcomed me with wide open arms uh, to come into his extremely high-end refractive surgery practice in Vancouver. This guy was 6,000 eyes ahead. The, the heaviest hitter in New York had done 200 eyes of LASIK. This guy had done 6,000. Uh, he'd started way earlier. The Canadians are quite ahead of the US. They still are. <clears throat> and he said, bring the machine. We're going to have a lot to do. And so it was this relationship built up where I was his fellow, but at the same time, both of us were learning from the machine. Because the machine was giving us internal information of the layers of the cornea. And, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. Just because a cornea might be slightly bent doesn't tell you why. But if you have a cross-sectional image and you can see why, what, what is going on inside the cornea. It led us to really start to understand about the complications of laser eye surgery. And let's wind the clock, you know, 20 years ahead now. I'm running, um, you know, potentially the largest uh, complications repair course in the world at the European Society of Cataract and Practice Surgery every year. We have standing room only, room of 600 people. Uh, for a two-hour didactic uh, course and a two-hour grand rounds course where audience members bring their cases and a panel discusses them. And we've turned complication repair into a formal discipline. In fact, I, I, I suggested and run the therapeutic refractive surgery section of the Journal of Refractive Surgery. We started that in 2014. Um, and now there are a number, rather than just a handful of us, there's a growing number of eye surgeons who are sub-specializing in the repair of complications. And the ultimate goal, 
and what I'm working on now is to try and develop software, uh, artificial intelligence, that can help any surgeon fix a complication, even if they are not as expert as, as I am. Uh, the idea is to, to pack uh, this learning experience into a, a, you know, a, a, a machine that has evolved to understand what to do next in this situation or that situation. To be able to do that, you need the layers individually of the cornea. And isn't it crazy that this all came from this serendipitous moment uh, that I spent scanning a rabbit cornea at 7.30 in the evening and the next morning the professor not saying to me, yeah, I think it could be useful for this or that and then I get put off thinking, oh well if it's good for something already I want to look for something else. So, it's a funny story. So, where the high frequency ultrasound research uh, came into ICL uh, was also, you know, again in one of these moments, right? I was teaching a course in 1999 in Seattle at the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Uh, the title of the course was Mysteries of LASIK Revealed by High Frequency Ultrasound. And I was showing all of these things that we'd learned about looking at the layers of the cornea and how you can diagnose things. And this often rather elegant um, aristocratic uh, looking um, Italian ophthalmologist came up to me and, and said, uh, this is one of the most interesting courses I've attended at the meeting. I abs where can I get a prototype of this machine because I absolutely need it for my work. And it turns out that this was Carlo Lovisolo, who was one of the very first people to be implanting ICLs. And he knew that the sizing, just by external measurements of the eye, was unpredictable and there were too many eyes that needed an, an exchange of a lens. And he wanted this to be zero. And I mean, you think about it, if you measure where something's gonna go and then you choose the lens, you should, the, the, there should never be a sizing problem. I mean, it's like GCSE maths, right? It's simple, it's just trigonometry. But actually, <laughs> there are biological variables. So just to get closer to a near zero exchange rate, you need to be measuring where you're putting the lens. And he understood that. So we eventually, within a couple of years actually, we got him a prototype in Milan. And we started working together. It wasn't my area of interest, but I was interested in helping him solve the problem. And we worked on understanding the exact relationships between the external and the internal measurements. What, was there a way that, were there other external parameters that we could add that would increase our predictability of ICL sizing? And there were. But what won the day was the obvious. If you go behind the iris and measure where the lens is going to go, you're going to get more predictable. And he introduced this concept of measuring what's called the sulcus to sulcus. It's basically the iris the lens is here and the iris has a little curve here and that's called the sulcus and like the armpit if you like the armpit of the iris and from one end to the other and you measure that and you correlate that to which lens you're going to choose and that became amongst expert users the the the, the method of choice for sizing the ICL wind the clock back forward about 10 years we've now published uh, some papers showing that the Loisolo method and his equation worked way better than just the external measurements, even when you pile other external measurements on it. Kind of obvious that the direct measurement is better than the indirect measurements. Sadly, he developed a brain tumor, um, and it was a very nasty one, and he lived another year. And I went to visit him when he was, um, he'd had his neurosurgery and he was actually looking pretty good and visited the family and we had a very, very nice evening. And well, there was no telling how much longer he was going to last, but sadly he, 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 he didn't last more than a few months after that. And it took a few months for us to get our, 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 our research program 
um, reorganized. But I told my team, uh, we're going to put everything we're doing right now aside and we're going to finish the ICL sizing work. And we set out to do what we were going to do with Carlo next, which was to not just look at sulcus to sulcus, but look at other dimensions behind the iris and seeing whether anything else would add to the sizing predictability. And when we did the regression analysis, we were kind of baffled at first because we found a measurement behind the iris, which had, it didn't even have a name because obviously we measured randomly every single thing we could because you never know what's going to come out of the statistics. And I said, well, if we're measuring from here to here, that's the ciliary body, why don't we just call it the ciliary body inner diameter, CIBD, flows off the tongue. Turns out that the CIBD predicts the, the sizing of the ICL better than the sulcus to sulcus. And in fact, it's so much stronger than the sulcus to sulcus that you can't even get the sulcus equation into the equation anymore. It just throws it out because the CIBD is so much more powerful as a predictor. We included that with a few other parameters that had never been thought of as sizing elements. One of them is measuring the standardized pupil size in a standard lighting conditions. Um, um, and between these and a couple of other measurements that, that were known before, we derived a formula. And this formula is such that we now, well, other, other than a very strange eye, we now have the ability to predict where this lens is going to go and how it's going to fit with almost full certainty that we're not going to have to replace it. Um, and I, you always have to say almost because there's, you, you can't say never and you can't say always in medicine. But we've got this thing to a level where we're, we're, we're really enjoying the predictability of this lens. It takes away a huge um, uh, anxiety factor really uh, associated with you know performing or, or planning this surgery. And when you think about the ICL as a, a technology of its own, the lens itself, if it is properly sized, is one of the most amazing devices that we have to offer patients vision correction. Because the accuracy is as good as you are at measuring the prescription. And you can correct exceedingly high prescriptions with astronomical amounts of astigmatism with the same accuracy as you have measuring the prescription. It's, um, it's really an amazing technology and uh, very grateful to STAR for having stuck to this one product for all these 30 years because they've now come up with a lens that is a wonderful vision correction element and combined with the ability to size it uh, you know, with as much certainty as you can have in biology, uh, we're into an era where I used to say that laser refractive surgery can correct 97% of all refractive errors, and I, I mean that, which is correct. But actually, I would say now, given the ink, the, the, these, the, this last element of sizing that's been introduced to the ICL, I would say that probably 94% or 93% of all eyes will be corrected by laser and the rest up to 100%, let's say up to 99.9% .9 of prescriptions can be corrected by ICL. And even those prescriptions that are beyond the ICL have a 99% chance of being able to be corrected by an ICL plus laser. So we're into an era where glasses are really going to be optional. Uh, contact lenses. And you think back to the 60s, 1960s, Gene Roddenberry, when he thought of Star Trek, and you look at version one of Star Trek with Kirk and those guys, none of them were wearing glasses. And this was in the 60s. So somehow this Star Trek future uh, is here today.